So you've got two armies, one well-equipped, well-trained, well-led with increasing amounts of sophisticated weaponry and ammunition, and another army nominally large in size, but very poorly led, very poorly closed, very poorly equipped. Uh, Lord Dunnett, thank you very much uh, for joining us in the briefing room. What is your view of this continued use of air bombardment of cities that aren't uh, directly in the line of, of military attack by Russia? Well, I think, um, Adam, there are several points to make there. Vladimir Putin knows that certainly for the time being, he's making no progress on the battlefield. Uh, the war, as far as the war of movement is concerned, has genuinely gone into the deep freeze with the onset of winter. So he is resorting to two forms of long range attack. Um, today is a classic example, a horrible example, of a very large number of missiles being fired um, particularly at um, infrastructure targets within Ukraine, uh, focusing, as we've seen over several weeks and a month or two now, uh, on power infrastructure in particular, to try and weaken the morale of the Ukrainian people. I think history shows that, frankly, this kind of attack just never works. Um, it didn't work in London. It didn't work in Coventry. And frankly, if we're honest, it didn't actually work in Germany um, as far as our own attacks were concerned. So I think uh, he's wasting a lot of ammunition and time in trying to weaken the Ukrainians' morale as far as that's concerned. And I think also one has to bear in mind the attacks that are going on in Kherson at the present moment. Uh, yes, the Russians under great pressure from the Ukrainians withdrew, gave up Kherson city, and they are entrenched on the east side of the Dnipro River um, with the city easily in artillery range. But there is no tactical possibility of the Russians recapturing Kherson. So this is vengeful, indirect missile and artillery firing uh, on the civilian inhabitants of Kherson. <clears throat> and frankly, if that continues, it's the kind of activity that gets pretty close to the war crime category. Um, I think we have to watch that one very, very carefully. Do you think uh, that Western nations, NATO nations, should perhaps think of giving... Uh, Ukraine, what it would like, a greater means to protect themselves from these sort of air attacks, which I, I think probably includes uh, air power, the, the, the loan of planes. Well, I, I was about to agree with you until, until your last comment. Um, yes, um, NATO countries, in particular the United States, are supplying increasing numbers of highly sophisticated air defence uh, weapon systems. Um, the Patriot system is being supplied now to Ukraine. It is taking and will take a little while before Ukrainian operators are competent to use that system. Um, there are many other uh, air defense systems that are already in place. Now, you raise the question, and we've had this discussed many times over the 10 months of this war, the issue of whether a plane should be supplied. Well, I think there are two issues there. One is some of the former... Uh, Eastern Bloc Soviet satellite countries, such as, as Poland, um, are willing to supply aircraft that Ukrainian fighter pilots are conversant with. That is one thing, and that is fairly similar to uh, gifting them T-72 tanks and other hardware that the Ukrainian army is uh, competent and capable and familiar to operate. I think it's a very different thing if Western countries, uh, UK, France, Germany, the United States, was to consider giving uh, our state-of-the-art fighter aircraft. Apart from anything else, the length of time it would take to train Ukrainian pilots on those sophisticated systems would probably be greater than hopefully this war is going to last, although that comment begs, begs a whole, whole lot of questions. But um, it's also, it ups the stakes uh, as far as giving Vladimir Putin the opportunity to criticize the West even more for getting even more closely involved with this war. So air defense systems, yes, um, Western high-tech, fourth, fifth generation uh, fighter aircraft, air defense aircraft, probably not. Now, you, you said the conflict itself is going into the deep freeze. Historically, of course, the winter has been Russia's friend uh, against Napoleon and uh, against uh, the Nazis. How, how's What's the effect of winter and the very, very cold temperatures on the two sides now? Well, I think the effect of this winter is going to have 
the reverse effect that Russia normally benefits from. I think what we can see with the two armies in the field at the present moment is the Ukrainian army, well-led, well-motivated, their soldiers now well-clothed, they're well-equipped and they're well-trained, and they are much more capable of surviving the cold and being able to fight in the cold. The Russian army, on the other hand, has mobilized a lot of additional soldiers. Uh, we know from very um, clear intelligence reports that the equipment, the clothing that they've been issued with is very poor. So you've got two armies, one well-equipped, well-trained, well-led with increasing amounts of sophisticated weaponry and ammunition, and another army nominally large in size, but very poorly led, very poorly clothed, very poorly equipped. And in this case, I think Russia is going to be the loser um, as far as winter is concerned. Normally, uh, Russia, go back to Napoleon's 1812 campaign, go back to Hitler's uh, Operation Barbarossa. Normally, the winter favors the Russians. In this case, we may find that actually the winter favors the other side, favors the Ukrainians. And it's the Russian conscripts, the Russian soldiers, who will be really feeling it. Um, and this is going to have quite an effect on, on what happens come the end of the winter and the early spring and who months, what offensive and when.